Management Association. And it's wonderful to have you all here. And it's great to, to partner with the Economy of Communion and Elizabeth Garlow to host Jeffrey Sachs in this, I think, very important conversation on how to transform the economy. And with regard to this initiative by Pope Francis that's called the Economy of Francesco. And some of you I know are aware of this initiative, others may not be. So we're hoping to do a couple of things, get some general perspectives and then also a bit more concrete uh, uh, understanding of, of what is um, the Economy of Francesco. Um, I thank you all for being here. We're taping this. So I hope that's okay with you. If it's not, please un uh, to turn the camera off. Um, thank you, Jeff, for being here. And thank you, Elizabeth, for doing this. Uh, this whole initiative is part of the Humanistic Management Association's work to, to help transform organizations in service to life. And that includes business organizations, that includes all kinds of organizations, including government, including any kind of institution that deals with the economy and society at large. And Jeffrey, you have been working a lot on these issues for a long, long time. So it's wonderful to have you with us. I'm gonna turn over to Elizabeth because at the Economy of Communion is, is the partner or the organization that does the, organizes the event uh, on the Economy of Francesco. So there's no better partner than, than uh, you to have with us. So thank you all for being here. And Elizabeth, please take it away. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Garlow, and I co-lead the Economy of Communion Project in North America, which Michael referenced. We're one of the organizers of the upcoming Economy of Francesco event. So I thought I'd just give everyone a few words of background on who we are and what this event is about before we kick it off to, to Jeff Sachs to, to share some of his remarks. Um, we're really excited to be working with Michael and the International Humanistic Management Association. It's a really important partner. Also in thinking about the conversations we'd like to have leading up to this Economy of Francesco event next month. Uh, so just a, a bit of background. The Economy of Communion is an international association of roughly a thousand enterprises worldwide that are seeking to foster what we call communion in the marketplace through business and profit sharing activities that really center the message of the gospel. Uh, we were started by the Focolare movement, which is a lay movement in the Catholic Church back in 1991. And in February of 2017, Pope Francis met with many entrepreneurs and grassroots participants of the Economy of Communion project. And there he sort of gave us a lot of words of wisdom and sort of a, a call to action to what he called, quote, change the rules of the socioeconomic system. So in the words of Pope Francis, for a project like this to be faithful to its origin and charism, it really needed to go beyond caring for the victims of our current economic system and really think about strategies and ways to build a system that no longer produces victims. Um, and so we, as part of that dialogue with Pope Francis, um, a lot of efforts have continued moving forward, including this upcoming Economy and Francesco event. Um, so what is this event? Well, uh, last year, Pope Francis issued an invitation to young people to what he called, quote, enter into a covenant uh, to, change a to, to change today's economy and give a soul to the economy of tomorrow. So March 26th through 28th, about 2,000 people, young people will gather in Assisi, Italy um, to hone new insights and build collaborations and draw some inspiration from, from Pope Francis and several other collaborators on this event, including Amartya Sen, Muhammad Yunus, Kate Rayworth, of course, Professor Sachs, who we have with us here today. So this event really is a result of collaboration between Pope Francis and the Economy of Communion and a number of others who are interested in coming together to think about building a new paradigm, building a new narrative that really helps usher in an economy that is fair, sustainable, inclusive, and doesn't leave anyone behind. And so as part of this uh, event, we have a series of workshops and convenings leading up to the Economy and Francesco event. I myself am a, am a participant in the upcoming event and a number of us have been gathering folks together to reflect on that message of the, of the Pope in our US context. So uh, Professor Sachs needs little introduction. Of course, he's a world renowned professor of economics, a leader in sustainable development, a senior UN advisor, best-selling author, um, and over time, he has advised the leadership at the Vatican, working closely with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Studies, 
sciences. So it's no surprise that he's been tapped as a critical participant in this upcoming event. So without further ado, I'd like to go directly to Professor Sachs and hope that you can share a little bit of your hopes um, and aspirations for this upcoming Economy and Francesco event. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the <coughs> opportunity to be together with everybody and uh, have a, a great discussion. I think the Pope and, uh, and the church is uh, calling uh, on us to uh, remake the underpinnings of uh, not only the economy, but how we think about the economy, uh, the approach to teaching at the universities, uh, and the way we uh, think about uh, what is uh, good uh, and uh, just uh, in uh, the world today. Uh, a lot of my reflections on this issue come from the fact that the modern uh, economics as we teach it at the universities is a profoundly flawed uh, framework uh, that needs a fundamental revamp from a, a deep reconstruction of the ethical underpinnings. And I believe that the church's social teachings, uh, as well as other uh, dimensions of global society, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the UN Charter, the commitment to multilateralism uh, and to uh, human rights, uh, and now the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, are important components of a new ethical framework for the economy. My starting point in practical terms is that the world is very rich, uh, and yet there is both uh, enormous uh, poverty and suffering within our rich world, and we are blindly rich, as the Pope says, with the globalization of indifference uh, that is uh, blinding us to our uh, incredibly self-destructive uh, proclivities, uh, including the environmental uh, destruction that has reached uh, alarming levels. I've tried to understand uh, how it is that as a, uh, as a uh, supposed uh, human uh, intellectual pursuit, economics is so off course. Uh, I'm a practicing economist for 40 years. I've been uh, studying and uh, working on economics for 48 years now since uh, entering a college uh, in 1972. And uh, it took me a long time to realize uh, how wrong so much of what I was taught, uh, in fact, is and how odd uh, so much of the uh, ethical underpinnings of uh, modern economics uh, how incorrect they are. So I've been trying in my own uh, thinking to reconstruct uh, both uh, what an ethics uh, for our economy can be and how uh, what we call, loosely speaking, neoclassical economics, which is uh, the economics taught, broadly speaking, in most universities of the world, in most textbooks of the world, uh, has become such a strange entity incapable of seeing or solving the crises of poverty in, in the midst of wealth, uh, societies that are uh, seeing a collapse of social capital and the self-destruction of the natural environment. It's a, a long story that I hope to tell and, and uh, one of the things I'm hoping to do in the context of uh, the economy of Francesco is uh, write a couple of books uh, about this. Uh, and I know Tony Annette is on the line and we're planning on uh, doing some of this work together, including a, a revamped uh, principles textbook uh, that uh, would be on a sound ethical basis. I, I won't go through uh, a formal presentation right now, except to say that most uh, Western ethical thinking uh, reflects a, uh, combination of Greek thought uh, initiated uh, really by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and Christian thought, uh, starting with uh, Jesus' teachings in the Gospels, and then uh, the uh, theology of uh, Christian teaching uh, from Augustine to Aquinas, 
uh, and then the modern social teachings that really commenced uh, with uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth and uh, Rerum Novarum in 1891. And I think that the ethics uh, that combines uh, Greek uh, philosophy and uh, church uh, social teachings is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, it gives a diagnosis of uh, uh, the human of human nature. Uh, of the uh, search for well-being, uh, as Aristotle uh, called it, of course, uh, evdomonia or eudaimonia, uh, and of the basic equality of human beings uh, as uh, created in the image of God in uh, Judeo-Christian uh, thought from uh, Genesis uh, onward and through the Gospels. Uh, and this is a very rich uh, tradition, Western tradition, essentially, which I think can undergird a modern uh, economic uh, philosophy. But the economics that we have in place is not based on uh, either uh, the Greek thinking about uh, the good, eudaimonia, uh, or uh, the church's social teachings and the essential equality and dignity of all human beings. Uh, it's based on uh, a very different philosophical thrust, which I argue uh, in an intellectual historical sense, probably starts with the nominalism of, uh, of Ockham, William of Ockham, uh, but certainly in British thinking uh, depends on Thomas Hobbes, who uh, did not uh, talk about the search for the good, uh, but rather talked about the insatiable desires of uh, individuals that leaves uh, a uh, society or that leaves individuals solitary uh, brutish uh, and uh, with a short life unless controlled by the leviathan so hobbes's uh, idea was not uh, cultivating reason and virtue but rather uh, the uh, inevitability of insatiable desire and that notion of uh, will or desire uncontrolled by reason, I would say, is the British uh, tradition uh, philosophically uh, going through Hume, uh, Mandeville, uh, and ultimately to the invisible hand of Adam Smith. Because the underpinning of the philosophy is that we are uh, each egoistic individuals with our personalized tastes, there is no human nature per se, there's just individual will. Our demands are insatiable, uh, they can't be conquered uh, by reason. Uh, and so what's needed is some combination of a state that to keep us from killing each other, that was Hobbes's idea, and a marketplace as the vent for our greed. Uh, by which, it, and according to uh, the thinking of Mandeville and Smith, paradoxically turns greed into the common good through the workings of the invisible hand. And this is what I was taught in economics 48 years ago when I opened Samuelson's textbook. Uh, I learned that individuals are egoistic, self-regarding, uh, will-driven, with given preferences uh, that uh, can be harmonized uh, through perfect competition in the marketplace and that each individual should maximize their individual uh, will, and that in the end, that would lead to a decent social outcome. I think the problem with all of this is that it doesn't lead to good individual outcomes, it doesn't lead to good social outcomes, and it doesn't lead to uh, even survivable ecological outcomes. So the idea of the individual insatiable will being given uh, free reign in the marketplace uh, is a clever and wrong idea that uh, motivates a, a lot of uh, behavior, but actually greed ends up producing a lot of greed, a lot of criminality, a lot of inequality, uh, and a lot of uh, environmental destruction. And I believe that this philosophical idea of uh, human beings as being uh, inevitably and insatiably driven by desire uh, is actually the flawed starting point uh, that we have to remake uh, in order for a new economics to work. 
So my proposal is that the Greco-Christian uh, great synthesis of Western uh, ethical thought is our starting point. And I believe that modern psychology and neuroscience add a lot to that and are fully compatible, I would say, with that, uh, because they also show the common human nature, uh, the need to cultivate reason, uh, the need to control our worst uh, impulses, uh, the possibility of us controlling our worst impulses, uh, the need to have moral reflection through rational uh, contemplation, the uh, universal uh, dignity of human beings, and therefore uh, their universal right to basic economic needs, especially in a world of plenty, give a different kind of economic foundation, I believe. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that a textbook, a principles textbook will prove this, uh, and it will certainly highlight many of the church's core social teachings. Uh, not only uh, the dignity of uh, all individuals, but uh, two crucial teachings, of course, uh, the preferential option for the poor, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the universal destination of goods, uh, which is the church's doctrine that private property rights are not inviolable, uh, that uh, the rich owe to the poor what is rightly the poor's, that there are economic needs that are the rights of every individual by dint of human dignity, uh, and that a modern economy can function by observing those economic rights and promoting human dignity. Uh, and so in essence, uh, I believe that we have the basis for a new kind of teaching. Uh, and in this textbook, instead of starting with insatiable tastes and maximizing preferences, uh, the book opens, uh, the draft book opens with the human well-being and human dignity and asks what is it in an economy that uh, is needed to support human well-being and to ensure the human dignity of all. And it's very different. It doesn't start with the individual budget constraints and market equilibrium. Uh, it starts with uh, our purpose, our telos, uh, or our uh, irreducible right of human dignity, and then says that economies can meet such needs if they're structured in particular ways. And it does not sanction uh, insatiable desire. It says it should be brought under control. It says you, we should get a grip uh, on our uh, avarice or our consumerism or our greed, as both Aristotle and Aquinas uh, taught uh, over the last 2,000 years. And I believe it will lead to a different kind of uh, economic understanding. So I would like our students in the first day to reflect not on a marketplace or private property or utility maximization, but on human well being and on human dignity. And uh, to start economics with the idea that an economy should promote both of those. That's uh, really the purpose. And uh, that's uh, my message uh, for. Uh, the economy of Francesco next month. Back back to you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. That's amazing. Um, one other question on the economy of Francesco event um, before maybe we kick it over to you for, for some slides is we're curious to hear you reflect on why the why the Pope might be issuing this invitation specifically to young people today. I think he's been inspired um, in, in part by the climate activism movement and the role of youth in, in leading that that movement. And so what do you think are the implications of building a groundswell of young people specifically who might be leading the charge on sort of building a new economic foundation as you articulate it? I think it's a part of the Pope's uh, genius of uh, understanding us and uh, social change to go to young people for this. Uh, there will be some old types uh, around uh, in the room. Uh, in the discussions, uh, in the brainstorming. But I think it is uh, literally responding to the calls of young people all over the world for a new economics uh, curriculum, first of all, um, because that's very explicit. Uh, there are many groups saying, we don't like the teaching we're getting, it doesn't make sense. And of course, uh, it is young people 
that have probably played the most important role in the climate agenda in, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it's rather remarkable that uh, Greta uh, Thunberg and uh, students uh, striking for the future uh, really changed already European politics uh, by uh, having uh, all parties of the European Parliament adopt the European Green Deal. And it is a common view in Brussels, uh, at least, that uh, the politics was changed by the uh, MEP elections uh, last spring, uh, which brought Greens to power mainly on youth, uh, youth advocacy. And I hope we're seeing, frankly, I hope we're seeing the same thing in the United States with Bernie Sanders. That's uh, his uh, supporters are uh, 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 youth-driven, uh, um, and uh, I think he's speaking also to young people in, in the same way. So I think it's a stroke of genius of uh, Pope Francis, uh, not surprising, but uh, very clever that he didn't say, I want to get uh, a bunch of uh, practicing economists together to discuss this. He said, let's bring young people. And they expected a few hundred, as you know, they're up to 2,500. Assisi will not have seen the likes of this uh, probably since St. Francis himself. Uh, I mean, the number of people coming is extraordinary and they continue to pour in uh, people, you know, asking to participate. So there's a lot of energy in it. Great. Professor Sachs, um, you had some slides. Did you want to talk through any of that or should we shift to, we have a number of questions coming in from I think we should. Uh, yeah, I think we should go straight to the questions actually. Great. Michael, do you want to field the first couple? So actually, I just uh, yeah want to hand over to Ravi Chinta, who had a question or two. Maybe we can start with one. And everybody else, please feel free to put your questions in there. Make sure they are concise, short, and end with a question mark. So <laughs> not so much the comments, but the questions. Thank you. Ravi? Yeah, I'm sorry. My questions were not short uh, because I wanted to give a little background. I taught at a business, a Jesuit business school, several precepts of Jesuit philosophy, such as Marges, Cura Personalis, and seeing God in all things are very well integrated into the Catholic way of thinking and being. Uh, given these strong foundations, I have two questions. Question one is, how do you explain the misdeeds and acts of selfishness in the governance of church institutions? You see a lot of uh, bad things happening. And question two is, that's more philosophical. If one sees God in all things, then there's really no discrimination. However, knowledge is all about discrimination. For example, a distinguishing between good and bad that comes from knowing stuff. So my philosophical question is, is knowledge anti-God? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, if I go back to Aristotle, who is uh, my, my favorite philosopher, um, he taught that uh, the human soul uh, is, uh, is a divided soul between the rational uh, part of the soul, which can discern what is for the good, and uh, what he called the animal uh, and uh, vegetative parts of the soul, the appetitive and perceptive parts of the soul, which he said respond to stimuli, uh, which respond to short-term desire, and so on. And so Aristotle already uh, in the ethics uh, and in uh, De Anima taught that uh, we're divided creatures between good and bad, uh, and that uh, the way to a good life is by cultivating uh, the virtues of rationality. And of course, he uh, named several of the virtues, four of which became the cardinal virtues, phronesis uh, or practical wisdom, uh, uh, fortitude, uh, uh, or Andrea, uh, 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 justice, uh, dio, uh, di diacosine, uh, and, uh, um, and temperance, uh, or sophrosyne. Uh, and the idea of all of these uh, is uh, that you have to cultivate reason to find the good, that human beings are perfectly capable of uh, both virtuous behavior and what 
uh, in uh, church's teachings uh, came to be called the sinful behavior. So we ended up with seven cardinal virtues and seven, uh, uh, seven uh, sins um, and, uh, or vices. And I think that this is the essence of human nature, which is that it's divided. Uh, we, are, uh, we may partake uh, in part of uh, our divine origin, but we're also capable of absolutely horrible things. And uh, philosophies which say that we're all good or all bad, I think are quite naive. Uh, whereas philosophies that say we have the potential for the good, I think are uh, really the right approach. And in economics, uh, much of this was dropped, of course, part of the secularization also. It's not a good or bad, it's just preferences. And when economics, uh, you know, your preferences are your preferences. You can't judge them. But uh, that's not what Aristotle <coughs> would have taught. He said there are some preferences that are smart uh, and that are really for your own good or for the good of the polis, the society, and others that are very harmful, very short-sighted, very self-destructive, and that you should know the difference and that it's not easy to know the difference. That's where cultivating virtue comes in. And how do you cultivate virtue? through mentorship, through education, through habit formation, uh, through uh, discernment and contemplation, uh, you find the good. And in Christian thought, uh, add in uh, uh, grace uh, and the Holy Spirit to help you find the right path. Uh, but the idea is that being good is, it's hard work. Uh, it's not simple. Uh, and I think that this is really part of the philosophy that we should be teaching, not just go out and maximize your income and maximize your preferences, but do the hard work of discerning what is really good for you and what is really good for the community and the society you live in. Professor Sachs, I'm going to try to synthesize a few questions that have come in. Um, so many folks are remarking on the ways in which uh, a number of scholars, particularly in the Catholic Christian tradition, have been thinking about applying these principles in business and economics education for some time. So the question really is, what, what do you believe is the unique translation of these principles for this particular moment in human history? So perhaps it's about discerning what kind of distinct policies and practices might emerge in response to today's challenges or sort of a, a retranslation of some time old wisdom. Thanks. I think there are two parts to that. One is the uh, challenges of the time. <clears throat> and to my mind, the encyclicals from Rerum Novarum onward in the cycle of uh, the church's teachings are really uh, very important because they are about the times. That was the whole point of Leo XIII. Rerum Novarum is of the new things of industrialization. Uh, and uh, Popolorum Progressio in uh, 1967 was about the new times of decolonization. Uh, and Pachamenteris was about the new times of modern geopolitics. And uh, Laudato Si is very much about the new times of the environmental crisis. Uh, and I should add, uh, Centesimus Annus in uh, 1991 was about the new times of the global economy after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So each of uh, these popes was grappling with something very practical. Uh, and uh, they were discussing not ethereal issues uh, from the Gospels. They were discussing the real issues of the moment uh, in Rerum Novarum. What about trade unions? What about factories? What's the responsibility of the factory owner? And uh, with the uh, Pope Francis, uh, it's about climate change. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, American conservatives are attacking him. How dare you talk about climate change? But it's, of course, at the core of the church's traditions to be in the times uh, and to be uh, dealing with the most important issues that humans are facing so that the church helps to provide a guidance. So this is one point. The second point is the philosophical point. If you look at Catholic uh, business schools and universities by and large, and I'm certainly not authoritative on this, but my sense is 
that the textbooks that are used are the mainstream economics textbooks. Uh, and that the economics that's taught is very much the mainstream economics. So there's the church's social teachings, but then there's the regular neoclassical economics. And I don't think the students are given much uh, explanation for the gap or that it's even pointed out to them. And in fact, of course, uh, there is in American conservative Catholicism, a strain of libertarianism, which I regard as entirely antithetical to the gospel uh, teachings and to the church's social teachings. But it's not surprising, in fact, because the formal training is a kind of libertarian training. Uh, and so if you study economics uh, at uh, many Catholic schools or Jesuit uh, universities, you're using a mainstream text. So I would like to see that changed, actually. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a Catholic text. It should be a text that is based on human dignity and based on uh, the values of the church's social teachings, in my view, which I regard as universal, uh, because I think not only do they literally resonate with other major religions, but I think they're offered uh, on a, a universal basis of universal human dignity. So I find them uh, completely coherent, for example, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is uh, the moral charter of the UN. And I want to see, and it will be in my textbook, uh, I want to see uh, the Universal Declaration in the first chapter as a core underpinning for any economy. Uh, we're going to try a, a, a new thing. We're going to try to cap, uh, to, to gather a couple of questions here in the virtual format. There's so many. So I, I'll ask Sarah Menard, Sandra Wardock, and Elias to be very brief. And, and Jeff, if you can just sort of uh, try to see if the, these, uh, if you can answer them potentially in, in a collective way. Sure, um, sure. Sandra, are you there? Can you ask a yeah, question? Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Thank you, Jeff. I think this is a terrific um, step you're taking here. Um, um, I'm wondering how you see your ideas fitting in sort of the, the sort of the global context in which um, most people in the South or the East or indigenous cultures have much more holistic perspectives that are uh, more earth centric than what I'm hearing from you. And I wonder how you would um, align your views with this earth centric orientation right. rather than a hum than very, very human centric. Um, yeah, yeah. Th thanks a lot. Okay, so earth centric, Sarah, Sarah, can you come in? Sure, yes. Um, thanks so much. Professor Sachs, it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I am working with the Islamic Development Bank right now on a couple of projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in all the work that I'm doing, um, you know, this idea that there is one God, an Abrahamic God, is a rallying point for an interfaith dialogue, but they're only you only can get so far with that. So I'm just wondering your reflections on how, what are the sort of theological and economic theological bridges you see that help us be radically inclusive across faith traditions so this dialogue is more global? Great. Elias, are you there? Can you unmute? Yes, hi. Um, uh, Professor Sachs, I've got a, a slightly narrower question. I know that some of the uh, organizing of the event in Assisi comes from the economy of communion and Professor Luigino Bruni, who's done all the wonderful work on the civil economy. I was wondering your thoughts on how we translate what seems to be a fairly Italian conversation into a wider uh, context. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. Uh, so let me uh, give uh, just a quick uh, reflection uh, on that. I, I find it incredibly helpful the idea of integral development. Uh, and this is really a, a core feature of Laudato Si and of uh, Pope Francis's uh, um, theology as well. Uh, so integral development means uh, that human well being is intrinsically relational. Uh, and it, it means, uh, and it's relational on many levels. Uh, well, the individual uh, with ourselves, with our friends, as citizens, uh, and uh, as part of creation. Uh, and I think that uh, the adding uh, the creation uh, part is uh, core to 
defining what is uh, reflectively well-being for us. Uh, and that's a lot of what Laudato Si emphasizes. So it's not, uh, it may be true, and I'm not really uh, deeply uh, familiar with the uh, indigenous uh, philosophies of uh, Pachamama and uh, the center of uh, um, the, the physical earth uh, as uh, the very center or nature. Uh, but I think integral development uh, is uh, a philosophy that uh, bridges uh, that the, the natural uh, creation and the human uh, society. And we should keep that in mind. Uh, and define, again, starting with the idea of human well-being as the absolute uh, building block of an economy, uh, make sure that that includes our uh, nature as uh, natural beings and our relation to, to the creation itself. Uh, that links to the question of uh, the theological uh, global uh, underpinnings I'm hopeful, uh, it's, so it's a, uh, probably uh, partly a statement of hope and partly a statement of experience uh, that there really can be a global ethic uh, that is, uh, can help move us forward. Uh, we have been involved in recent years in a project called Ethics in Action, which was a, a series of workshops at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and Social Sciences that involved uh, Religions for Peace and other multi-faith organizations bringing together not only the Abrahamic uh, faiths, uh, but also uh, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, uh, many different uh, Christian uh, uh, faiths, uh, and indigenous uh, um, representatives uh, as well. Of course, this was a self-selected group, but the essence of our discussions over a couple of years was uh, how strong the commonalities are uh, of uh, human dignity uh, as being at the core of all of these uh, faith traditions, uh, and therefore how there could be uh, not an identical language, but a shared language of underpinnings of ethics. We're coming out with a volume uh, based on that, which I'm very excited about uh, that shows from many different faith perspectives, including Asian uh, religious uh, traditions, uh, Hindu, uh, Buddhist, uh, and others, that there really is a, a, a basis for a more universalist um, ethics, uh, I should say, that could underpin uh, a universalist uh, discussion of the economy itself. On uh, civil economy, I'm a huge fan of, uh, uh, of course, uh, Luigino Bruni, uh, uh, Leonardo Bacchetti, and Stefano Zamani, who are the three, uh, three musketeers of the civil economy. And I think they're doing an amazing job, uh, both in practical terms, because they have many specific ventures uh, as well as in philosophical terms uh, of the basic idea of Genovese, who uh, is the progenitor of civil economy, that uh, economic transactions have a moral component to them. When you are transacting in business, uh, you have a, not just a, a Kantian uh, duty of uh, honesty, uh, but you have a human uh, goodness uh, uh, benefit of honesty in your transactions. And I, you know, am reflecting more and more in that regard on the famous sentence of uh, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. And I love Adam Smith for a lot of reasons, but, you know, he famously said, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. And uh, I reflect on the fact that uh, in our neighborhood, when we go to uh, our bistro or our local restaurant, it's, it's actually nothing like that. Uh, it's a human relationship. It's not a, an impersonal relationship. 
Uh, and that's the pleasure of life in this community. Uh, that you don't, that I'm not uh, even to the chef or to the waiter or uh, to the owner of the restaurant appealing to their self love. But actually, we are in a little bit of a communion of dinner or lunch when we're doing this. And that's what civil economy is about infusing the economic transactions with uh, civil relations. I think it's an important component of a larger story. Uh, the larger story also includes core ideas of uh, preferential option for the poor, of uh, basic economic rights, of universal destination of goods, uh, which I've mentioned already. But I think uh, civil economy in its uh, rethinking the nature of economic transactions is really a very lovely and practical way to do it. So I see it as a part of this whole picture. Professor Sachs, we're going to jump to the next uh, batch of questions. I think that worked fairly well last time. So we'll do three in a row. So I'm going to ask Marta uh, Pedrajas, John Bunch, and Tom McGlynn. So Marta, we'll start with you. Uh, hi, thank you. I hope you can listen to me. Yes. Uh, I'm Marta. I, I work uh, in UNDP. I'm also working with a team of uh, Economia Francesco in the Village of Inequalities. So Great. I hope to see you there. Wonderful. And I just was wondering um, how can we do this to put this into practice? No, because uh, you, we know uh, very well the 2030 agenda and the SDGs, and we lack of this uh, anthropological foundation, uh, philosophical foundation of the international agenda, because it's impossible to negotiate with the with the member states in this uh, United Nations environment. It's, it's very difficult not to go deeper in anthropo in anthropological perspective so I and, and the church uh, in the other hand offers a strong a strong view of the human being theory of justice for the society so how can we integrate more this uh, this proposal into the international agenda if it's if, if possible no I think it's the way to go because we have, you, a, have the, the center of the human being and the society so how can what can we do Great, perfect. Thank you, Marta. And then we'll go next to John Bunch. John, can you hear us? Okay, we'll go to Tom McGlynn. <coughs> I think he said he doesn't have a mic, but Sergio. Okay. So Sergio I. Barrera. <laughs> ah. um, so why don't we. St we'll, okay, so we'll go to Sergio. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Sergio. Oh, hi, Professor Sachs. Um, I guess my question is, so I'm a grad student at the University of Minnesota. So I'm at a very secular university that's very focused on the main paradigm of utility maximization. Absolutely. And I understand pragmatically why we make the assumptions we do. A lot of it has to do with data access or tractability and things like that, but it does seem to conflict with things that we care about as Catholics. And so my question to you is, how do we conduct research in a way that promotes and enhances these, these richer notions of well-being that we have, while at the same time using the tools that we have been taught and also influencing other economists in the field that are probably a little bit more hostile to us? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So uh, should I take uh, Martha and Sergio's uh, questions first? Yeah, that's great. The, the question from Tom McGlynn, which I'll just add to the bunch here, is, yeah. is really a question on metrics. What are the metrics that, that you believe are really critical in helping us usher in the economy of Francesco? Which Excellent. is a, a big question, of course. <laughs> great. Th yeah, thanks. Actually, uh, also very closely related to Sergio's uh, uh, question. Uh, which is uh, how to use these tools and uh, how, how to teach and so on. Let me start with Martha about uh, how to put these issues into perspective. I believe that uh, there is a strong link of what we're discussing and Agenda 2030 uh, and uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, no better exemplified uh, by the fact that Pope Francis uh, gave the opening 
uh, speech on September 25th, 2015, uh, on the eve of the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and uh, to my mind, that uh, is the uh, utter uh, reflection of this strong linkage of the ethical underpinnings and the practical policy. And one of Pope Francis's uh, wonderful statements in Laudato Si is that interdependence obliges us to think of a common plan. Uh, so he called for a global plan. And the closest we're going to get for that is indeed the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. They're not exactly plans, but they are agreed frameworks and agreed targets. And uh, that's a, a very important part for us, I believe. So uh, how do we put this uh, into uh, effect? One is that we introduce uh, ethical idea to our discourse uh, about uh, these two global agreements. Uh, at the UN, we have the big advantage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which starts, by the way, not with rights, but with dignity. So uh, it, it's a very wonderful document, actually, uh, that is, I believe, uh, utterly aligned uh, with the, the uh, ethical issues uh, and social churches' uh, teachings. So if we can frame the SDGs more uh, as part of a universal dignity, uh, I think, uh, and point out that governments for the last 72 years have at least uh, been uh, signed up to universal human dignity, I think we make the bridge. From a practical point of view, in addition to putting this into teaching, which I think we should do, uh, there are so many wonderful processes of uh, ecumenical or uh, interfaith dialogue where I think we should uh, be active. So uh, Sanangid, com uh, Communite Sanangidio, uh, for example, every year has a wonderful, wonderful meeting uh, that is a, a interfaith leadership. Uh, the Alliance for Civilizations. Uh, is a very important venue for us. And the head of that, uh, Miguel Moratinos, uh, is, is completely uh, open and committed to the things we're talking about. Religions for Peace uh, is a very uh, wonderful group uh, that has the same commitments. And so I think we should be engaging with uh, all of these interfaith uh, uh, initiatives and helping them to champion Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement and not see those things as well, those are outside our faith work, but actually as very much part of the faith work after all. On the question of uh, research, metrics, and data, one of the very big breakthroughs, I believe, is the measurement of well being directly. Uh, this was uh, rejected. Uh, in Bentham's time, because Bentham had a very naive idea of, <coughs> of how you measure well being. He said it's the balance of pain and pleasure. And uh, since nobody had a pain meter or a pleasure meter, and since uh, Bentham was uh, pretty uh, naive uh, philosophically about what is the good, um, the conclusion came already in the 19th century we can't really measure. Uh, well-being. Uh, and then came the doctrine that we can't even make interpersonal comparisons of utility. Utilitarianism, aside from other limitations, is also practically limited because how do you add the utility of person A and person B? These are non-commensurable. So when I studied, and I think it's still taught, you know, we, we were taught basically you can't measure any of this stuff. All you can measure is revealed preference and demand schedules and so on. And that uh, led to the kind of axiomatic and tautological view that what is good is what people do, uh, what is bad is what they decide not to do. And that's pretty much the opposite of traditional ethics, which is what is good is what you sometimes are able to accomplish and what is bad is what you often fall into uh, because you're not being good. Um, or not choosing for the good. So 
I like the fact that in the last 30 years, there's a lot more direct measurement of well-being. And uh, my favorite question is uh, the question, how do you feel your life is going? Uh, because uh, that is a question that forces you to a philosophical, well, I shouldn't say philosophical, it forces you to a rational reflection on your life. And I think that is what eudaimonia is about, is that when you rationally reflect on your life, how do you feel about it? And we can ask. And psychologists have now done a great deal to ask. And they disprove certain basic things that we would be taught at Minnesota or at Chicago or at Columbia. You know, the worst paper in modern economics, in my view, and that's saying a lot, but the worst paper is a paper by Gary Becker called Rational Addiction, uh, where he said, yes, if you're addicted, that's okay. You're just utility maximizing uh, and you're trading off a present and future. And what's your problem? And economists take this seriously. And people with addictions are miserable. They have regret. They're unhappy. They're desperate. And Becker uh, isn't interested in that whole empirical side. But we can ask people with addictions, how do you feel about your life? And they say, I feel terrible about my life. I've thrown away my life. I've hurt my family. I've hurt my children. And that is really what we should be studying. Well, how did that come about? How can we avoid an economics of addiction? Uh, how can we help people to report that they feel good about their life? And uh, I was just on a call uh, just before this one with the World Health Organization. They have a new well-being division as one of the pillars of WHO. And they're empirically studying the question, what, how do people feel good about their lives? And this, I think, is part of the metric, Sergio, that, uh, and part of uh, what we ought to be modeling, actually. And I'm, uh, each year, I'm a co-editor with uh, my much more knowledgeable uh, co-editors, Richard Laird and uh, John Helliwell, on the World Happiness Report. We use a metric called the Cantrill Ladder, which asks people to put their life on a ladder. The zero rung is the worst life they can imagine. The top rung or the 10th rung is the best life they can imagine. And people are asked, where are you on the ladder of life? And the answers are fascinating. And you can explain the cross-country averages by uh, cross-country performance on a number of uh, social, economic, uh, and health indicators with a high fidelity. And so we learn that well-being depends on income. It depends on uh, physical health. It depends on mental health. It depends on social networks, loneliness, uh, concerns about corruption, uh, freedom of uh, action, because human freedom is also an important source of well-being, uh, but human freedom that is rationally bounded, not human freedom of insatiable desire. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of research that can be done on these topics now. Great, there are a lot of more comments and questions, some pertaining to the economy of Francesco and what's going to be discussed. Elizabeth, you might be giving us a little bit more context. Maybe, Jeff, you can also uh, share a little bit. I uh, see two questions that maybe have not yet uh, been asked, but David, are you, are you there? Can you ask it briefly? Professor Sachs, uh, Dave Ayat. I'm a priest in Los Angeles right now, an associate priest, but my background is in the area of globalization and the thought of Théo de Chardin. Great. And I am wondering where, when you were talking about your text, that you're coming out with uh, the focus on human well-being and human dignity, uh, the exploration of seeing the person as not only the person of the individual, but the person as community. And Théo's vision of this is helping us to see a bigger picture any thoughts, comments on this? I know Teilhard is starting to return into many avenues in this area, and it seems his vision would be something very helpful in what we're trying to do with the uh, economy of Francesco. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, let me uh, give a, a, a thought about that. When I mentioned uh, integral uh, development uh, and its relational aspects, uh, Pope Francis uh, talks about five relations. Uh, the individual to 
his own person, uh, the individual to uh, friends, uh, the individual as a citizen, uh, the individual as part of nature, and the individual relationship to God. Uh, and talks about the five relations and uh, that human well-being depends on all five of these relations. Uh, when Aristotle uh, talked about human well-being, uh, he introduced it in two volumes uh, that were really uh, together, the Nicomachean Ethics and the Politics. And the Nicomachean Ethics covered two of these, uh, a little bit three. Uh, it covered uh, the individual's own uh, search for the good and his call for moderation in all things. Uh, and uh, chapter eight of the Nicomachean Ethics uh, is uh, about friendship. Uh, and uh, chapter 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics, in a way, is about uh, contemplation of the divine. So you could say that it also touches on, on uh, the relation to God, though Aristotle doesn't uh, emphasize that very much. And then the politics is about the individual as citizen. Uh, of course, in the Aristotelian thought, the citizen in the city-state, in the polis. Uh, and now we have a much more complex uh, politics and uh, larger uh, political communities, including global community. But I do think that this is the tradition, uh, that uh, there's no way to talk about human well-being as just an individual, because there's no way to talk about an individual well-being except in a social context. Uh, and, uh, of course, Aristotle famously said that any person who would live alone is either a beast or a god, uh, and uh, that, uh, therefore, the social context is everything for well-being. So we need, in, in this textbook, it actually opens uh, this way with saying that human well-being has all these uh, dimensions, interpersonal dimensions. And then I'm anticipating chapters on issues like trust, uh, because uh, if we don't have an economics of trust, the economy can't uh, function properly. And the Wall Street definition of trust, which is get away with anything you can, uh, and your counterpart's a big boy, so if you trick them, cheat them, uh, that's their problem, not your problem. That does not make an economy function, and it certainly doesn't make for well-being in the society. So I'm looking for to have chapters on the self, on uh, the interpersonal relations, on the civic responsibilities uh, of individuals and of responsibilities as part of nature as inherent ways to discuss the whole human being. Great, thanks Professor Sachs. Well, I think we're nearing the end of our time here. So I wanna just give you a really big thank you um, for the rich conversation and for your time with us here today. And for all of you um, incredible active participants for sharing your insights and questions as well. Um, as we wind down, I just wonder, Georgia, is there anything uh, that you might like to say from an Economy and Francesco committee perspective on the contents of the event or what to expect? We still have you with us. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. The, the contents are still a secret till end of February when we have our official press release. Um, as you probably all know, we're going to have 12 villages. We're already dividing the candidates. We have gotten some really good uh, ideas on new methodologies to use, mostly all that come from a humanistic perspective. Something that Professor didn't mention because he's a humble leader is that something very nice about all the keynote speakers and all the senior people that are going to be part of the village is that they have this service vocation. So it's really gonna be focused on what young people wanna do and they're just gonna act as mentors. So they're not gonna have, I mean, they're gonna have an active role. And, but, and something else that's interesting is that all the ambassadors from the Holy See are gonna be participating. So once we have the pact with the Pope, they wanna see if they can share, share it with their governments, you know, and we can see where we can take it from there. So again, you can write to us, follow us. You can, obviously there's, you guys all have a regional group with Economy of Communion North America. So you can, we hope that there's gonna be regional follow-ups after the actual event. So anything you may need, please get in touch. We'd love, I saw people write about indicators and stuff. If you have ideas, please send them through. 
And I'll Wonderful. just quickly note, oh, I'll just quickly note, we dropped a number of links into the chat function. So we do have an active Slack channel here in the US for those who would like to build working groups and discuss these issues and continue the conversation. We will also gather in the US on October 6th in person in Washington, DC for a follow-on event. So if you're interested in those types of follow-on opportunities, we'd love to have you have you join us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you everyone for being on. Thank you, Jeff, for doing this. This is wonderful. This is great. Um, I think we need all your help to bring these ideas into the world. So please feel free to connect. Uh, there are various ways, as, as Elizabeth just mentioned, also the Humanistic Management Association is trying to facilitate this. Thank you all for your collaboration. Thank you, Jeff, again. Thank you, and Jeff. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Have a great day. Uh, all of you. Thanks. And if we could keep uh, the chat, uh, uh, there were a number of questions and topics. I'd love to uh, read through it. Okay, we will send that to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm. Take care.